Sally, where were you born? I was born in Dunedin. Um, my dad was at med school when I was born, and then he, when he graduated, we moved north to Nelson, where my sister was born, and then into Auckland, where my other sister was born, and we basically lived in Auckland. I was brought up in Auckland, went to school in Auckland. Which school did you go to? Epton Girls Grammar School. So not far from where you live now? No, no. <laughs> I was brought up in Remuera, went to Eggs, then went off around the world, came back to Auckland and thought, I'm never living in Remuera again, and where am I? Where have I been for the last 20 years? Remuera. And I'm now co-president of the Epsom Girls Grammar School Old Girls Association, for better or worse. So uh, the connections go round, yeah. yeah. And did you show early promise as an artist as a child? No, I was always creative and I liked doodling. Um, but I never did art at school, ever. Um, I was encouraged to take Latin rather than art, so I did. I liked languages and I was taking French. I wanted to do French and art, but no, no, Latin. So I did Latin and I quite enjoyed it. Did German, never did art at school, but I was always on the side doing creative things. Not particularly art or drawing, but a lot of writing and just imagining things and creative stuff. And all through my adult life, I still always had a creative streak, I guess, yeah. So after school, did you do any training? Did you go to university? I, well, I got my UE, and the last place I wanted to go was university. Absolutely did not want to go to university. Um, and I'd done a, been lucky enough to do a big school trip around Europe, around the world, really, for two months when I was 15 for German students. And that basically gave me the travel bug that I'd already had since I was five anyway. Um, and so when I finished school, I just wanted to go back to England, basically, back to London and Europe. And mum said, well, how? And I said, well, I'm just going. And she said, with, with what? <laughs> what are you going to do when you get there? I went, mm, okay. Um, so she said, well, why don't you do a secretarial course? And I said, what? <laughs> and then I thought, well, actually, Okay, and so I went to ATI and I did the secretarial course over a, a year, which was shorthand, which was another language, code, love it, absolutely loved it actually, um, and then I worked for a couple of years to get some money behind me, because I was in the real world then, I realised I needed to get to London with something, and so, yeah, so a couple of years later, I took off to London with a girl that I'd met at one of my first at my first job who was English and wanted to go back her parents had immigrated over here and she wanted to go back so January 1982 we took off I just turned 19 and uh, yeah took so off into the big in, wide world how long were you in Europe I lived in London for nine years yeah loved every second of it had a had a ball um, saw a lot of the world um, yeah, well, I mean, my first jobs were temping and yuppie days, and, and I, again, I, I always was doing something creative. I actually took night classes and life drawing and was always doodling in any spare time I had at work, which in those days was kind of quite a lot because it was the yuppie days and nobody really worked. It was party and, party and uh, a bit of work in between. But um, then I got, then I decided I'd better get, get a real job like a career job, not just having fun, um, and ended up working for the International Planned Parenthood Federation Europe region, which was kind of like my dream job, and that was in the mid-80s. Um, so working with issues like sex education, abortion, um, incest, rape, all the family planning type issues, but cutting edge sort of stuff, and also dealing a lot with Eastern Europe, which was, of course, in the throes of well, Romania with Ceausescu and Russia, the USSR, Soviet, sort of all the restrictions placed on women. So it was all about women's rights and health and well-being. So it was really um, an amazing opportunity. And I travelled all around Europe and throughout the world and met lots of amazing people. Um, probably not as creative in those times, in those years, because I was really busy working and travelling. I didn't have a lot of downtime. Um, and when did you come back to New Zealand? And then came back to New Zealand in 1990, end of 1990. Um, kind of thought, what am I doing? But there was an unexplained, I've got to go home. 
and everybody said what are you doing and I said well I don't know but I've got to go home <laughs> and so I came home and really enjoyed it um, was glad that I did and yeah sort of found it difficult to get the kind of job that I really wanted because there was nothing on par with that but because of my interest with family planning I joined family planning association here as a volunteer member and got very involved with different committees I was on the board and um, yeah was highly involved so that kept that sort of passion alive for me um, and work-wise I worked for the Foundation for the Blind which again you know that whole not-for-profit um, sector was where my passions were and, and you had a problem with your, your own eyes at some point didn't you? I did it was um, yeah, I was working for the Blind Foundation and organising a conference in Christchurch and one day my eye just went funny and I sort of blurry and it was nothing specific, it wasn't sore or anything and Dad, I was Dad who was a doctor, I said there's something funny with my eye and so he took it very seriously because you do with eyes and it ended up that I had optic neuritis which is a virus that attacks the optic nerve and quite rare, um, but generally hits women between 28 and 32. I was 30, so um, yeah, so basically the sight shut down in that eye just over several couple of weeks, which was right when I was down at this conference surrounded by blind people. So I was actually blind in one eye, and it was so disorientating because to just have monocular vision is actually really, really difficult to cope with all of a sudden. So, um, yeah, so and it was painful. It was it was difficult, and you're never quite sure if you're going to get your sight back in that eye. I was lucky that I did pretty much 99 percent. Um, so the colour was a bit faded for a while, but it gave me a real appreciation of what it is like to cope with, you know, sight difficulties and sight impairment. And I worked a lot with blind people of all all sights, all sorts of um, vision impairment. Uh, it yeah, really didn't stop enjoyed. you though, you weren't skiing. Oh, it didn't you? stop me at all. In fact, no, we'd all organised to go skiing after this conference. Me, a guy who was completely blind, a guy with one leg and a guy with no arms, I think. They were all dis disabled. It was a disabled skiers thing because I was involved with the disabled skiing at that time. And here was me with one one eye. And honestly, I just couldn't even ski. I, I didn't know which way was up. So of all the disabled people, I was actually the the most, um, yeah, hopeless on the ski slopes that day. But um, luckily it came right. And uh, yeah, and now I don't even know which eye it was, to be honest, yeah. So when did you start painting? Well, I had always drawn, I guess, more than painted or doodled and um, done portrait -y figure type things and I had always wanted to paint but I didn't know what I wanted to paint and I didn't know how to paint because I'd never had an art lesson in my life and one day I saw a photo of Little Barrier Island from Omaha Beach which is where our family has a beach house and we're one of the first people to build up there in the 70s and I just saw this photo and I thought my own that would look great as a painting and I thought oh that might be the painting that I need to paint and so I looked at it for a while and then I thought right I am going to paint this and I went and got a canvas and I got some paints and thought mm, where do I start so I did quite a big painting like um and anyway a couple of hours later it was done and I couldn't believe it and it was probably quite crude technically I imagine but it looked okay it looked like the photos so um so I thought oh this is good and really haven't stopped from there and I actually sold I gave that painting to mum for Christmas and um somebody saw it and wanted to buy it and she and I said but it's not for sale it's my mother's and she said well sell it and paint me another one so I did and um yeah and that was the beginning of my painting journey and I wonder I do wonder if I hadn't actually sold that painting whether I would have even done another one probably I would have but you know selling your first paint and then I painted another painting and that sold as well so I thought oh I'm not stopping here and um, just yeah haven't stopped. And when did you start writing because you're a published yeah. author as well. Writing well I've always I've always, I've always written stories as a young kid and I don't know where those 
exercise books with those funny little stories are. Uh, a lot of writing for my work of all sorts of reports and that sort of more business professional writing. And yeah, I've always known I've got a book in me, but I didn't know what, again, what the story might be. And when we were on holiday, the boys were young, I think it was 2002, we were sitting on the beach at Waihi and this book came to me and I started writing. And I'd read it to the boys that night and write again the next day while they were learning to surf with their dad and whatnot and read it to them again that night. And this whole story came alive and I, and I invested a lot of time, several years writing it. It's been in abeyance now for ages. Um, but the time is right for me to get back into it because there were some crinkles that needed ironing out and I think I've ironed them out given time and technology and how the world has evolved. Um, so that's sort of when I started really writing creatively. Um, I've got three books that I'm writing in the process of writing and hopefully publishing one day. Um, I like writing short stories, I do blogs, I like travel writing, I write for a travel magazine, anything really. I just love writing, yeah. And you make lots of masks. And I make lots of masks. Where did that start? Zillions of masks. Well, the mask thing's interesting because I've always had a fascination for it and, and for Venice um, and that whole masquerade mystique thing. Um, and interestingly, a, fr a friend who I worked with in my early days of painting, she, we together did quite a lot of markets and things and so we painted, did glass painting actually as well as painting and we sold our stuff at markets, this was way years ago. And we thought, what are we going to call ourselves? And we came up with masquerade, nothing to do with masks in those days. And anyway, she moved away to Australia and, and I carried on creatively. And the mask thing came to me. Um, basically, I sort of had this fascination with creating my own masks, but I didn't have any base to use. I didn't know where to go for a base. I didn't want plastic, nasty things that, that were around. And actually, there wasn't a lot around in those days. And then... My kids were at primary school and one of the mums there, her husband had a fascination with masks as well and he was also an inventory type and had made this machine that made masks. And so here it was on my doorstep. So so the base of the mask was, um, it's basically, that's one using, using the base. Um, needed cutting and shaping and everything but there it was so I did quite a few mask workshops at the kids school just creative kids sort of stuff and a couple of the mums said oh I'm going to a masquerade do can you make a mask for me oh okay got the base I sort of got a few things together to do it so I did and it's just grown from there um yeah basically started off like that about I suppose 15 years ago now and yeah, just uh, my my armory of all things masks has grown <laughs> exponentially. And then migrated up into wow costumes. Yes. How long ago? Did Actually, that start? it did stem directly from masks. My involvement with wow because um, two friends were having their fiftieth birthday parties, and I had made them each quite ornate wall art masks, Venetian style with the pointy bits and whatnot. And they had a lunch on Waiheke, and so I took these masks over and presented them to them at the at this lunch. There were about 15 of us there, I suppose. And they were like, oh, wow, wow, wow. And then one of them said, you should enter WOW. And I said, what do you mean? Because I hadn't even seen the show. I didn't really know much about it in those days. And this would have been 2010. And um, I said, but I can't sew. I can't make, I can't make costumes. I don't sew. And they said, but you make ma masks. You should just do something based around a mask. And so I went away and I sort of kind of thought about it. And that night started planning, <laughs> planning my first WOW entry and um, got very involved with it and made a male and female costume um, based around these masks that I made and entered it. But they were deemed too costumey, too theatrical, which... I had no idea what I was doing back then and now I understand exactly what they were saying and so um, undeterred I d 
decided I would enter again the next year, but they had quite a few workshops and you could find out what the judges were actually really looking for. So I went along to those and learned heaps and um, yeah, and the next year entered two and they both got in and just yeah, took it from there. So I've had six garments in the show, over four shows. Three entries this year are away for judging at the moment, so I've got my fingers crossed. And, they're all and I, my, I, oh, my ideas for next year are already brewing and I want to start on them, but I'm not until December <laughs> earliest. <laughs> all constructed in this rather beautifully crowded workshop. Yes, well, also migrating upstairs to the take over the lounge as well, much to the boys. Well, they've got used to it now, but um, yeah, it becomes a life. Life, day, night, takes over life. It's and you, big, it's and you recently big. learned to play the piano? I have. I have. Last year I was thinking about, I've always wanted to learn the piano since I was young, but I never did. Um, I played the recorder and I, and I did do guitar lessons, but um, so I could read music. But I'd always wanted to learn the piano, and we've got a piano in our house, we, which we bought off the people who had it before us, and it's a beautiful piece of furniture, but that was about it. And I could teach myself to a certain level, and then it just wouldn't go any further. And then people had sort of said to me about how their elderly mothers who play the piano really entertained themselves for long periods of time and kept their mind alert. And with a mother-in-law who's, you know, got dementia and... Um, didn't have anything like that to amuse her time and, and things, I thought, oh, that's a good thing to do. And on the third person within a week saying this to me, I thought, right, I am going to learn. Came home and in the letterbox, would you like to learn piano? Give me a call. <laughs> yes. So I did and um, took it up. And I realised now why I couldn't get myself any further teaching myself because the left hand, right hand thing, it's like a bit of a challenge. Um, but yeah, I love it, and I'll sit down and just tinker away. Yeah, I'm never going to be any Mozart, but, but I do love it, and it really, that getting that mind, left hand, right hand thing going is a challenge and also really satisfying when you nail it. Mm, so it's it's all good, good part of the creative process. Mm. So you paint, you make masks, you make costumes, you draw, you're musical, you write, you transcribe. You like doing all of those things. Mm -hmm. So are you going to continue doing a whole mix of things? Yeah, I always, I always, you'll notice sport's not in there. I don't play sport. <laughs> Apart from skiing. I exercise my mind and my soul. Oh, I love skiing, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I'll always continue doing hundred things it's what I love to do and I work best at night um, not a morning person at all um, I can cope with a few emails in the morning but I don't get creative until later in the day um, but yeah I, I like to always have a whole load of projects on the go um, which can be challenging at times um, I work to deadlines time is no good for me deadlines are good and I'll always make a deadline probably always by the nth hour but that's okay as long as I make the deadline yeah and you enjoy traveling you just Love. had a yeah world trip recently yep yep um, yeah Brett and I the boys left home and we left the country and we went off for a two-month trip around France Spain Portugal Morocco absolutely loved it I've traveled a lot um, in my time but um, it was the first time we'd really done a big trip like that just the two of us without kids or um, yeah so it was fantastic um, any more planned yes well, next year next year I'm hoping to actually take a cruise um, lead a cruise um, with a sort of creative focus um, for a cruise group so I'm working on that it's Venice to Cuba, Venice to Havana, next November of next year. So that's another little project to add to yeah, the zillions on the go. Um, and then Brett and I probably in 2018 will do another another big trip. Um, yeah, and 
Yeah, I I guess in terms of travel, I still have a great affinity with Europe, London, lots of friends there. So I do try and get back every couple of years if I can, just to catch up with friends, reconnect. And, yeah. mm. Cool. Well, I look forward to seeing your costumes in WOW this year. I hope so. Sunny Blythe, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.